Hey, what's up everybody? Chad Kalick here and welcome back to the Intercredit Room Podcast, episode number 18, where today we're going to talk about how to deal with skepticism. I got a message yesterday morning of somebody asking that, how do you deal with skeptics telling you that you're lying? And my best answer to that is it depends who I'm talking to. More often than not, if someone is skeptical of the paranormal, I invite them to come out with me to go hunting, to go somewhere that I know is haunted, and hopefully they will uh, take me up on that, which I have three stories that I'm going to share with you that were all awesome, because one of my favorite things in the world is to watch a skeptic become paranormally woke, I guess you could say. But I also want to say this too, I think with time and age, you care less about what people think, and I think that's just the natural progress of going from being a child to a boy to a man. You know, when I was younger, I was more nervous about talking about my experiences and things that I had seen and filmed. And, and, uh, but as I got older, I guess I just realized that it's a, it's a vast world of mystery. And unless someone was going to walk the steps that I had walked, then I shouldn't care too much about what they think. It's kind of like, you know, me telling someone that's a skydiver you know, having never skydived, I can do it, no problem. It's not even scary. You know, how would I know? I've never jumped out of a plane. I could assume it would be scary because I'm afraid of heights. But my point being is I don't have the experience of a skydiver. So how am I going to tell a skydiver, you know, what he's experienced or what skydiving is like? It's kind of the same thing with ghost hunting. When someone says, well, I don't believe any of that stuff. And you guys are just walking around in the dark and it's just mass hysteria and you're all scaring each other and you know, and they have no idea that it gets so boring that half the time you wind up falling asleep in the dark, you know? Um, you know, how do you explain to somebody that says ghosts aren't real, you know, how do you explain to them what happened in Al Capone's cell at Alcatraz when you spent the night alone there when they've never had that experience? You know, so you have to take that to heart, that 99.99% of the people that I've met that say ghosts aren't real, they've never stepped foot inside the Waverly Hills Sanatorium. They have no idea what happens in the courtyard at 3.15 a.m. at Chillingham Castle. They have no idea. They've never been there. So they don't know. You know, they didn't grow up in the house that I grew up in where the two previous families sold the home because it was haunted. So you got to keep this in mind. But like I said, my go-to is usually, rather than argue with somebody... Um, Because I can understand the skeptical mind. Uh, Let me say that too. I fully get it. Even though I'm a believer, I call myself a skeptical believer. And the reason I say that is because 99.99% of all things can be, you know, figured out, can be debunked. And it's kind of weird because on this podcast, I'm telling you, you know, the handful of stories of things I've experienced over the course of you know, 25 years of doing this, you know, for every one story that I could tell you, you know, I have a hundred investigations where nothing happened. So it appears like, you know, when you listen to a succession of podcasts in a row, like every time I went out, stuff happened and that's not the case, you know? Um, but like I said, my favorite thing to do is just to invite people to come along with me. And, uh, I have three stories to share with you. Three great stories that, I I loved because they all three ended uh, in such a good time for me, uh, for the other people. uh, You know, it's it's always amazing to see the fascination come over someone's face when they, uh, you know, it finally sets in that they saw something that doesn't make any sense. And the first story I want to tell you is when I got this uh, Spielberg show, it was a Amblin Yahoo joint production that ended up uh, being sidelined during the financial crash of 2006 because all the big companies started cutting their marketing budgets and our underwriter was Ford. Uh, the Ford Flex was our underwriter. It was Ford's largest automobile they've ever made. And it was coming out right when the banks crashed and gas went to 550 a gallon. So that thing went away. But what was funny is when I first got the gig, uh, this guy Drew, that's super cool, loved him to death, uh, he was one of the executive producers. He called me into his office and he, you know, sat me down and just basically brought me in to say, "Is this real?" And it was it was funny how he did it because he was kind of like, "Hey, you know, between you and me, 
you know, we're all doing a job. We all want to do the best job we can. I'm like, okay. And he's like, and you know, I, I do whatever I could, you know, to do my job. I'm like, okay. And he was like, and I assume you're the same way. I'm like, okay. And he's like, so I guess I just want to know, you know, I mean, you know, is this stuff real? And I'm like, I'm what, the paranormal stuff? And he's like, yeah. And I go, oh, yeah, definitely. And he's pausing. And he's like, well, I mean, you know, I mean, if it wasn't, I don't care. You know, he's like, I just want to, you know, be successful. And I said, no, I, I hear you, but it's real. And he goes, yeah, well, I mean, but, you know, like if it's not, you know, I just want stuff to happen. You know? <laughs> I could just see he's basically telling me, if you want to fake stuff, go ahead. I don't give a shit. And uh, I thought that was funny. But, yeah, I told him, I said, yeah, no, it's very real. And, in fact, uh, one of the other producers was a friend of mine I went to college with. And he had never had an experience, but he was open-minded about it. And uh, the show wanted other producers to have experience. So they just kind of knew what environment they were going into. So they asked me to take my friend Corey um, ghost hunting. And they told me they would pay for me to go anywhere in the country to do it. So I took him to the Waverly Hills Sanatorium. And I only went there just because Waverly is just such a consistent place when it comes to activity. It's just always happening. And uh, so I told him the whole history of the place there and, you know, uh, all the people who had, you know, died from tuberculosis and the body shoot and the fourth floor shadow people. And he's like, well, where do you want to go? And I said, well, let's go to the fourth floor right away because that's, that's where the shadow people are. And it, it's the most consistent phenomenon I've ever seen where every single time I go back there, you see these things. And if you've never been there, it's just a super long corridor and the moonlight shines through the side of the building and you can kind of see these ever so dimly lit kind of light rays coming out of the corridors all the way down. And all of a sudden, you'll just see a completely dark black outline of a person just go walking by like it walked from the outside into a room. And then out of a room into the outside where it disappears. Sometimes it happens right away. And sometimes it won't happen all night long. And then you just catch one or two of them. So we go up there. And the whole time out there, you know, Corey's telling me, uh, you know, I, look, I hope I experience something. But, you know, if I don't, it's not a big deal. I mean, I do believe you. Uh, I know you wouldn't lie. And I'm just like, Corey, it's like, I feel like everybody's prepping me. Because they want me to know that they either believe or if it's not real, they don't care. I'm like, just trust in me, trust in this process, and let's just go see what happens. I told him, I said, if nothing happens, nothing happens, man. You know, I can't make it happen. I can't, you know, demand that it happens. And if it doesn't happen, it's not going to affect me. I know what I believe. I know what I've filmed. And so he's like, okay. And he's talking all big, too. He's just like, well... You know, just so you know, I'm not even scared of the dark, dude. So you just tell me where to go and I'll just go walking down there. No problem. And I'm going, okay. If you've never seen Waverly Hills, it is staggering. It is terrifying. It is this massive five-story, 100 and I think 80,000 square foot building with these big concrete gargoyles. Just terrifying. So right when we get there, he sees the size of it. And I could see on his face without saying a word that he's pretty geeked out. <laughs> and uh, you go in through the bottom, this like basement chute. And we go in through what's called uh, what we call the safe house. We come up on the first floor. And I'm like, go ahead. Go walking down the first floor corridor. There's all kinds of graffiti and all this <laughs> stuff on the wall. I mean, it just looks straight out of a horror film. He looks back at me and he's like, well, you know, are you going to come? I'm like, well, you're not afraid of this stuff. You're not afraid of the dark. So just go ahead. He's quiet, he turns back around, he's like, well, I'm just saying, I mean, I don't, I don't really need to prove that to anybody. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, it's cool, man, come on. So we go up these side stairs, and we get to the fourth floor, and I, there was a few friends that I invited out as well that joined me, and we're taking photos. And like the third photo that I take there is a shadow person that steps out probably nine feet directly in front of us. When the flash goes off, you see the perfect outline of it. And it's tall. It's probably, 
seven, eight foot tall. I mean, huge right in front of us. And I just hear Corey go, whoa, <laughs> it's quiet. I look over at him and he is petrified. He doesn't want to move. He is so freaked out. He looks stiff as a board. And I go, just see it. It's quiet. He goes, yes. I'm like, so let's go down there and try to find it. He's like, I'm good. Let's go home. <laughs> so we did. We actually packed it up right there. Ended up leaving probably 20, 30 minutes later. And uh, it was funny because that's all he, you know, the trip, that's all he was supposed to do is go out and go to a haunted place and go goes hunting. And if he saw anything, report back. So when we got back, he was working at Yahoo at the time. It was a lot of fun because, you know, the entire office just crowded around to hear Corey's ghost story. And it was so interesting watching, you know, his conversations before he had this experience and his conversations after. And before, I mean, he was like most people. He was like, you know, open to the possibility, and willing to accept it. But we'll see. And then he was so passionate with everybody about what he saw after he got back. You can see people's belief systems just completely grow in that moment. And uh, all kinds of magic is now possible. And I always say this, man, the world is filled with magic that we don't understand. And shadow people are a part of that magic, man. Um, I've seen them all over the world. I've filmed them all over the world. I've taken photos of shadow people all over the world. I don't understand it. I don't know what it is, but it is awesome when you see one for sure. It's awesome. And the second story I want to share with you is about my good friend, Robert Crook. Uh, Robert is an attorney in Los Angeles, and I call him the Tribune of the People because he is just an honest, honest guy, which I've always found a great irony in that his last name is Crook and he's an attorney, <laughs> which is awesome. Um, but I met Robert at an event he came to my Hollywood event years ago, probably, geez, seven or eight years ago. And I loved his approach. We were out at the beach and I had not even shaken his hand yet or spoken with him. And I was talking about paranormal state and cases that we've done. And I asked if anybody had any questions and Robert raises his hand and I call on him and he goes, this shit's real. And he says it just like that. This shit's real. <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah. And he goes, no, I mean, no bullshit. This stuff's real. And I go, well, yes. And I can see on his face, he's looking at me like, is this dude just a TV BSer? Is that why I'm here? You know, am I going to get hoaxed out? And I'm like, yes, yes, Robert, it's real. And we got to talking, you know, and he was just really on this voyage to see if things are real. And at that event, he didn't really have an experience. But, you know, I think he could tell that I was real, at least I believe that, because he started going to other events of ours. And then finally, we had booked an event at the Thomas House. The Thomas House is in Red Boiling Springs, Tennessee. And this place is on my top three list of the most haunted places I've ever been to in the world. It is another one of those places where not only does activity happen, but big activity happens. Things move. Doors open and shut. Uh, you can hear voices clearly. You can hear running through the hallways. Uh, it's this big old Victorian hotel in Red Boiling Springs, Tennessee, which Red Boiling Springs is this healing springs that people used to go to back, like, you know, I think it was like the 50s and 60s. And uh, it was a very popular place that celebrities went to. And then one day it just kind of went away. The business just kind of went away. So Robert gets a ticket to our event at the Thomas house and uh, he shows up and like, you know, any other event, he's just got a great personality. Everyone's excited to see him. And there was a very weird energy at that time because we were working on some hardcore cases. One of them was demonic. Um, we had just started to work on my family's case. Plus we were just doing three or four cases a month on paranormal state and as I've said before, you know, whenever you work on all those cases, that stuff doesn't just wash off. Uh, I absolutely believe you can take things with you to locations. And the entire cast of Paranormal State, plus my whole team, uh, was at this event. And I remember getting a really weird feeling about midday. This anxiety. It was just, I always felt like somebody was looking at me. 
So that night, we have a full house. It's like 40 people come out to this event. There's a group in the main cafeteria area, which is a big open area. I'm on the second floor um, with Ryan and a couple attendees as well. And it starts out, we're in this room. And again, you can just feel that tension in the room and you don't know why. And like a rocket, there's a side table with a lamp on it, just pops in the air, flips upside down and smashes against the floor in front of, it was me and two other people, me, Ryan and an attendee. And I am like, holy Jesus. I mean, that has my blood pumping, man. I'm like, wow. It was like two feet from me when it happened. And right at that time, I get radioed from somebody on Ryan's team. I can't remember who it was. But they said, Chad, I need you guys to get down here right now. And I'm like, okay. And I know down here means the cafeteria. So we leave the room. And we're happy to because we're like, wow. I mean, this table just flipped upside down with this lamp and smashed. So we're, we're running down the stairs. And we walk into the main cafeteria and Chip Coffee was there. And I see Chip talking to a group and I'm walking in and I haven't really spoken to anybody yet. And all of a sudden I see a crystal salt shaker just go ripping off a table, just flying like someone pitched it, like just like a rocket across the room. And I'm like, oh my God. And I look around the room, I'm like, anybody else see that? And then I realized right away, like a good five, six people saw it. And I'm like, geez. And I'm like, do it again. And I didn't see it, but I heard it happen again. I heard another shaker slide from somewhere and it hit somewhere and shattered and I didn't see it. And then everybody at this point is like freaking out. And Chip is telling me that his Coke can slid across the table. People are saying that they're getting EVPs left and right. And then I hear another radio. Uh, my walkie goes off again. And someone else is radioing me saying that another group on the second floor, that everybody is simultaneously having back pain. And I'm like, okay, this is way beyond expectation. Because when we go into these places to do events... We're not bringing people in because we want anybody to get hurt. You know, we bring people to places that there is an expectation of safe activity. And when I'm watching, you know, salt shakers rip across the room and tables flipping and lamps smashing and now people, you know, are saying that their back is hurt and things like that. I was just like, what is going on? And I immediately felt like we brought something with us and whatever is here wants it out. That is what I felt was going on. Just a theory. No way I can prove it. That's what I felt right away. And uh, so we radio around and say, let's get everybody in the cafeteria right now while we discuss what we're going to do. Now, we eventually had everybody go outside and um, there was a walkthrough in which I believe somebody did a cleansing or a blessing. I didn't take part in the religious stuff, so I stayed outside with the group, but I think that's what happened. But while we were in that cafeteria, I'm listening to everybody talk, and I'm just kind of looking around the room for anything else that's going to take off flying like that salt shaker because I don't want anyone to get hit. And I look over, and I see this. It's like a crystal punch bowl, and it's sitting completely still. And it just starts spinning slowly. And it's getting faster and faster, faster and faster. And my eyes are just trained on it like, oh my God, is this crystal punch bowl going to take off flying? And it's getting faster and 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 starts getting slower and slower and slower. And it's still spinning and my eyes are just trained on it the whole time. And I finally take my eyes off the crystal punch bowl and I look up into my right and I see Robert staring directly at it. Robert Crook has his eyes trained on it the whole time. He actually stops and says to everybody, guys, I just watched this punch bowl on its own spin in circles. And the look on his face was priceless again. It's that woke look. It's when the world becomes much bigger than what you thought. And I was so happy that Robert had that experience. And he had a great line at the end. You know, we all went outside and I was out there talking to everybody. 
And someone said, well, I don't understand why we're all outside. We came here to experience stuff. And I'm explaining to him, yes, and we want that. We just want to make sure that no one's going to get hurt or anything like that. And Robert goes, yeah, I'm all about safety. I mean, what's next? You know, we conjure up the fucking devil. And I have never laughed so hard in my life. It was just one of those lines that it was perfectly delivered by him. I'm sure I didn't do it justice, but the way he said it at that time, I just thought in my head, the guy that was raising his hand and telling me, you know, don't bullshit me, is literally terrified. <laughs> Standing outside going, so what's next? We conjure up the devil? Um, it was just a really awesome moment and to see his uh you know progression you know the mental progression of somebody that was interested who opened his mind and actively went to several events and i think that's the key when you're in search of answers you got to go to several events you got to do it a lot you can't just go into one ghost hunt and say well i went ghost hunting once and nothing happened so ghosts don't exist and i'm moving on and the third and final story I'm going to share with you was the last series that I did called Ghosted. It was on Verizon Go 90. It came out last year in which my co-host for that show was a beautiful, wonderful girl named Leanna Vamp. And the whole series was about her entrance into the world of ghost hunting where she traveled across the South because she wanted to learn about ghost hunting, ghost hunters, the equipment, the locations, the history, the different ways you can go about ghost hunting. The different roles you can play, whether it's just an active investigator that's into all the toys and gadgets, uh, you know, or a medium or a psychic and kind of exploring that ability. And the goal of the entire show was that she was going to meet me at the old Charleston jail in Charleston, South Carolina for a legitimate ghost hunt. So as she traveled across the South, she went to all these different places hopeful that by the time she arrived, she was ready for the real deal. And again, I can't say enough about Leanna. I had such a good time with her doing this series. But on the final ghost hunt, you know, I knew everything she had been through. And I knew for a fact that she had not been on a real deal ghost hunt yet. And I knew that the old Charleston jail was very haunted. And she could feel it, you know. She was walking around and I could tell that she was having troubles with it. And if you watch that final episode, the season finale, you can really see it. She has a breakdown. Things just become overwhelming. That's all I could say. Whenever you're around something that's paranormal, for me, there's an anxiety I get inside my chest. And I can just feel it. And she kind of had the same thing. And uh, she had this breakdown where she wanted to, she felt like crying. And she couldn't understand why. And I'm not an empath. I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's real or not. I never want to discount anything just because I'm not it. But if that's real, I think that's what she was feeling because she had these overwhelming emotions and uh, this overwhelming desire to cry, which I just told her, cry, let it out, you know? So it's time for us to finally do the investigation of the jail. And the jail is very scary. It's just old school. Um, it visually fits the part. It's terrifying. And we get to the investigation, and right before we do the investigation, I thought I saw someone crawling on all fours, like crawling on the ground on all fours right before we started. And at first I thought it was a crew person. And then I quickly realized, wait a minute, nobody's in the jail down here, nobody. And uh, I was like, let's go right now, let's go. Which kind of freaked her out because we were going to shoot the opening, then take a break, have a soda, and then shoot the ghost hunt separate, which by the way, if you hear snoring right now, that's not a ghost, that's Bugsy He's sitting right next to me. So because I see this, I'm like, nope, let's do it right now. Let's do it right now. And I could see on her face, she's like, whoa, whoa, what are, whoa, what are we doing? What are we doing? And, uh, and again, she's not a non-believer. She's wide open to it, but she's never experienced anything. So she's not a true skeptic, but she is skeptical to a degree like anybody is until you've actually experienced it. And right away when, when the hunt starts, there's this room to the left of us, the cell that's locked. And damned if you can't hear somebody jiggling that door and pulling on it and walking around in that cell. And it's loud. It's loud to the point that I look over and the audio guy, his eyes are bugging out of his head. He looked more terrified than any audio guy I had ever seen. And uh, we make our way all the way to the back of the cells and it just feels like something's there. 
and we hear this loud noise behind us and I look over at her face and she looked like she had seen the devil. And I'm like, audio guy, was that you? It's quiet. Yep. <laughs> you can hear it was him. He had hit something and uh, yeah, it just freaked her out. So we're walking all the way back to the front uh, of the cell and the door jiggling and the footsteps it was definitely definitive, I thought, for me, but I could see in her mind she was already, you know, trying to come up with, you know, excuses and reasons that could have caused it, which isn't a bad thing. It's a great thing. I think I've just been doing this long enough. I've ran these scenarios through my head so many times I can get to a quick, uh, you know, a quick answer in my mind. But regardless, I always do this thing before I leave where I'll say, Okay, we're going to shut down this investigation. I'm going to count down from five to one. And when I get to zero, if you're here, you have to give us a definitive sign or we're leaving. And I do this. And I go five, four, three, two, one. Pause. And right as I pause, it sounds like someone takes a two by four and just beats it against the wall in this room to the right of us. And I look back at her and the moment was there. She was now woke. <laughs> she was just ghost white again. It's so funny how when people suddenly wrap their mind around the paranormal, something happens with their blood that just makes people turn like pale. <laughs> you know, Because I look back and her eyes were so big and she was looking at me like, holy shit. And, uh, we ended up having a great conversation afterwards about all of it. And it was truly a mind-bending scenario for her where so much became possible to her. And her husband was such a cool guy. He was there. I had so much fun with him as well. And uh, I could see for both of them, this was a profound thing. And I think that's probably the best thing about ghost hunting. And what I always tell people why you should go and why I've had some of the best experiences in my life, the ghost hunting you know, whether you're a believer or not, you only stand to win. If you don't believe and nothing happens, then nothing happens, nothing gained, nothing lost. But if you don't believe and something does happen, then again, your mind opens up to this incredible magic that exists in this world. And so many more fantastic, amazing, mysterious things are possible. And the world is just a cooler place. So if you need a reason to go ghost hunting, that's it. The world could become a cooler place. Now with that, my friends, thank you once again for listening to episode 18 of the In a Crowded Room podcast. I will be back tomorrow with more. All the best.